morning, everyone. Uh, so in yesterday's lesson, we basically repeated uh, the Chatelier's principle. Uh, the Chatelier's principle applies when a system is already at equilibrium. We should have both reactants and products. Basically, I poke at the equilibrium. I stress it out uh, by changing temperature, changing concentration, pressure, adding a catalyst here. And basically, what we saw was the equilibrium, nature uh, will respond by shifting either left or right to try to undo our change. Um, we interpret that in terms of graphs just to try to help us understand uh, why that shifting actually occurs. I'm going to give you one example problem with that. Once we're done with this question here, we're going to switch over. Uh, we're still studying equilibrium, but we're going to introduce some of the math uh, towards the end of this unit here. So uh, just as a quick warm up here, I'm going to give you our Haber process again. So the Haber process here is 2NH3, uh, the heat term should actually be on the left hand side, so we have that one, uh, plus uh, N2 gas and 3H2 gas. Right. So that's the equilibrium as written. We're going to assume that we are already at equilibrium, and that's when I can start poking at the system. Uh, this time, let's do two shifts just for practice here. Uh, what I want you to do here is my stress. My stress is going to be uh, let's uh, in let's decrease temperature. Right, we increased temperature yesterday. So let's decrease temperature, let's cool down the box. Uh, can you tell me what happens uh, uh, to the system? And then B, uh, the stress, right, you can poke at it many different ways. Uh, the stress is I'm going to actually remove uh, N2. Right. Um, so I'm gonna let you work your way through here. Tell me which way it shifts towards. Uh, tell me some of the consequences. So tell me which concentrations go up, which concentrations go down. And this is the annoying thing here. I want you to do an explanation. Explain in terms of rate. So talk about, oh, what happens to the forward rate or the reverse rate? Remembering that the forward rate depends on the reacting concentration. That's going forward. The reverse rate depends on the product concentration going reverse. Right? So again, I encourage you just to pause the video, try it out for yourself. Uh, you can even draw a graph to help with your explanation. Let's do the easy part first. So let's figure out which way is it supposed to shift to. So assuming that you've tried it out for yourself here. I'm going to think of this whole thing here as inside a box. Right? That's my equilibrium system. It was happy the way it was. The concentrations were constant in time. Suddenly what I do is I poke at it and I decrease the temperature. I pull down the temperature, although it does cool down the entire box. One easy way to find the answer is think of the heat term as a chemical and actually pull that chemical down. Which side do I want to shift to to generate more heat? Well, if I preference the reverse reaction, if I force more of the N2 and the H2 to go become NH3, that's going to spit off more of this heat term here, and that's actually going to uh, regenerate some of the heat. So I already know my answer here. It's going to shift towards reactants, or you can just say shift left. Uh, what's the consequence then? As I shift to the left, what happens to NH3? NH3 is a reactant. As I shift to create more heat, I also produce more NH3. This one goes up. What happens to the N2 and what happens to the H2? Those ones there go down. So again, effectively, I already know the answer because I can predict shifts right. Oh, sorry, shifts left. But again, just telling you shift left doesn't actually explain this feature here. Explain in terms of rate. Next, now I'll think in a little more detail here. What I've done is I've made the entire system colder. When, partic uh, when particles are colder, we know all particles slow down. Meaning in chapter one, we have less, uh, less species with sufficient energy to react. Right? We needed the energy argument to get over the energy hill. We needed the geometry argument to have um, the smallest hill possible. So what's going to happen here is I know both rates are going to be slowed down because all the gases are going to be affected because there's a decrease in temperature. However, the question here is which rate would be slowed down more? Right? So let's think of in terms of a potential energy diagram. So we have a PE diagram. Uh, so far, this is written as an endothermic reaction. Um, so we have two NH3s. We have N2 and 3H2s. So that's as written, reactants and products. By decreasing the temperature, the activation barrier does not change. It isn't any easier or even any harder. It's just the fact that the particles themselves don't have enough energy. I have even less chance of getting over this hill here. 
notice which direction is harder to begin with, which activation barrier is bigger. Well again, for an endothermic reaction, I notice that the EA going forwards is a lot uh, bigger than the EA going in the reverse direction. That just naturally happens for an endothermic reaction. So as I cool it down, although it's going to slow down both sets of particles here, both are going to have a hard time getting over the hill, well, the NH3 already had a hard enough time. You cool it down some more, this one here is going to have an even harder time getting over the hill. So in terms of rate, your explanation can look something like this. Uh, although all particles slow down, I would e emphasize here the forward rate decreases or drops more than the reverse rate since it was harder to begin with. Right? Even before you cool down the system, it had a much bigger barrier to actually surmount. Right? It was harder to do that. And now you cool down both, you've slowed down both particles, you've now made the forward rate even harder than it was before. So if I think in terms of rate here, if I try to plot like a rate versus time graph, at first we were at equilibrium. At first our forward rate and a reverse rate was perfectly fine. They were neck and neck. This one here was at equilibrium. As I cool down the system, both rates are going to drop, no problem. But like we said, because the EA forward is, was already so much harder, the forward rate is going to drop a lot more significantly than the reverse rate. We now have an instant where the reverse rate is actually higher than the forward rate. When that happens, the products are going to become reactants faster than going forwards. That actually explains my shift towards reactants. Over time, however, we are going to steadily use up my products, so um, the reverse rate is going to gradually drop off even more than it had before. As you slowly pick up more and more ammonia, this one here is going to steadily climb again. They will eventually equal out, but at least for the time period here where the reverse rate was actually higher than the forward, this part here is actually your shift right. So without a mine, shift left. Uh, without a mine of its own, the equilibrium knows uh, to shift left to go to the left hand side. Let's see if we can do that similar explanation for the second shift here. This one here is a stress uh, by removing N2. Again, let's do the easy part first. Let's figure out the answer. If I remove N2, uh, the shift, it's going to try to respond. It's going to try to get uh, some more N2 back. So it's going to shift. In this case here, my N2 is on the product side. I'm going to actually want to shift towards products to end up regenerating some of the N2. So just let me rewrite uh, this expression here. 2NH3 became N2 and 3H2. Basically, this is all sitting inside a container together. Our stress was I pulled away a lot of the N2. Well, equilibrium doesn't like that. It wants to shift to regenerate it. This time, it wants to shift towards products. It wants to recreate some of that N2. Again, I ask you the sort of the consequence here, sort of what happens as that shift happens. The consequence, what happens to the NH3? Well, as you shift to the right, I'm going to lose reactant molecules, the NH3 drops. What happens to the H2? Well, as I shift right, it's going to produce more products. The H2 is a product. This one here is going to increase. The N2 one is going to be the hard one. Again, I want to just think in terms of graphically for that one there. For a concentration versus time graph for your N2 concentration, my N2 started off being equal in time. We were at equilibrium. Suddenly at T1, you've decided to pull away N2. N2 drops all of a sudden. There's only a sudden jump in that one. As I shift right, however, I'm going to then replenish. I'm going to start recreating some of the N2. The N2 is going to climb. Le Chatelier says, although the direction is counteracting my shift, it never really gets it back up to what it was before. So you notice that even by the time I reach equilibrium, by the time I'm constant in time again, my value is actually lower than what it started with. So you can say in consequence, the N2 is actually lower I actually prefer that terminology here. This just means it is less than the original equilibrium. Because what you're going to get confused here is you're going to say, well, I know the, sh the stress pulled it down, but I thought during the shift it's actually climbing. Definitely it is increasing during the shift. I'm trying to replenish it. But all I'm saying here is I'm saying it never really quite gets back to what it was to begin with. It's like overall I have dropped from the starting condition. So again, we already know the answer. The only part we haven't answered is that uh, pesky little phrase here. We have not explained it in terms of rate. You have not talked about uh, 
is the forward reaction affected? Is the a reverse reaction affected? So that graphically speaking here, what we're talking is we're wanting to think about like a rate versus time graph. Uh, again, let's just think in a little more detail here. Well, what does the forward rate depend on? The forward rate depends on the reactants, right? So we can just write down here, the forward rate depends on um, NH3, right? It's the reactants in that step. What does the reverse rate depend on? Well, the reverse rate here compares products becoming reactants. The reverse rate depends on the N2 and the H2. Right? So at first they were equal. Before you did T1, before you did the shift, the forward rate was equal to the reverse rate. That's necessary for equilibrium. Those rates have to be equal to each other, not just constant in time. What I've done during the shift is I have artificially removed N2. I've gotten rid of N2. Right? So suddenly in my container, I suck out a lot of this N2 here. First question is, does the forward rate care? Well, the forward rate just relied on two ammonias. The ammonias had to collide with each other. In some sense, it doesn't really care that there's less N2. So I would argue here the forward rate at first doesn't care. Let's just say it just sort of steadies out here. The forward rate only depends on NH3. You just pull the N2. Nothing changed with the forward rate. However, the reverse rate that needs N2 to collide with 3H2 here, now that you have so little N2, you've actually made it harder for the N2 to actually collide with the H2s. With less N2s, the reverse rate actually drops off. At this point here, we have our forward rate is actually bigger than our reverse rate. And this one here is actually explaining this is our shift rate. Eventually, over time, we will steadily use up more than NH3. So the forward rate here does end up dropping off later on. And the reverse rate, as I pick up more and more products, as I regain those N2s here, it's not as hard for the collision to occur. This will eventually start climbing again. But at least during the uh, shifting position here, um, let's just explain it in terms of rate then. Um, during, uh, during the stress, the forward rate doesn't care. There is less N2 because the forward rate doesn't depend on it. It doesn't need that to collide. But the reverse rate decreases. So the forward rate at first didn't really care. It was just the NH3s that needed to collide anyways. But suddenly you have so much less N2, the f reverse rate drops. Anytime the forward rate is bigger than the reverse rate, that explains the shift rate. Again, the whole notion here is equilibrium does not have to have a mind of its own. Just based on what happens to the rates, it actually specifies for me uh, which direction the shift is going to be. Right? So uh, make sure you practice through some of the Chatelli questions. Make sure you're able to predict shift left and shift right. What we're going to switch gears into for the next uh, two or three classes or so is we're going to switch over into a little bit of the math. For the rest of this lesson here, I just want to introduce to you our, you our main um, sort of math number that we're going to deal with. And that's a notion we're going to call the equilibrium constant. It is a number that I associate for that particular equilibrium. The equilibrium constant could typically just be called k. Uh, just in this chapter here, they're going to just specify, oh, this K is for any equilibrium, so they just go subscript EQ. Um, we want to be really comfortable with KEQ because we're going to find in Chapter 3, we'll do KEQ again. We're just going to rename it KSP. In our acid-base chapter, we're going to do KA for acid, KB for base, KW for water. They're all equilibrium constants. They're all this feature. So the better you understand this, it'll help you out in the long run here. Right. Fortunately, it's not su super hard a concept here. Equilibrium constant, it's a number that describes your equilibrium. Equilibrium constant here is defined as the ratio of product concentration to reactant concentration. That's all it is. It's just a number that describes how many products you have in comparison to reactants. This has to be at equilibrium. Right? It is an equilibrium constant after all. Equilibrium. And I'm going to emphasize more so in this lesson here, uh, it has to be at a given temperature. You can reach an equilibrium at any temperature, but comparing one temperature to another e temperature, you actually have a slightly different equilibrium. Right? So let me just do that in terms of the math here. Even that definition in words may be even more hard than it needs to be. I'm just going to say KEQ. Just for argument's sake, we're going to put concentration of products on top. 
and we're going to do it as a ratio of concentration of reactants. Right? That's all KEQ is. Now, of course, as they give you different reactions, you have different reactions, different products, you just need to put down uh, the exact chemicals for the equation that's given. Let's think in general what this KEQ number represents then. What if the KEQ is large? What if the KEQ is something bigger than 1? For this fraction to be bigger than 1, that would tell you in general your numerator has to be more than reactants. So in general, if I have a large KEQ, I don't care what temperature I'm at, I don't care what the chemicals involved are, if they tell me that the KEQ is a big number, large KEQ means uh, lots of products or more products. In the terminology here, you can say products are favored, right? We have more of them. Uh, because KEQ is dealing with concentrations, KEQ never drops into the negatives. However, we could say, what if KEQ is tiny? What if it's some fraction between 0 and 1? In the words, I can say small KEQ. For a fraction, uh, we're going to have a denominator actually bigger than the numerator. Small KEQ actually means we have more reactants. Again, just let me introduce to you some of the uh, notation here. When you have more reactants, you can frame that as reactants are favored. We have more of them at equilibrium. Right? That's a little bit strange because, hey, we're at equilibrium. I thought the concentrations are constant. They're constant in time. They don't have to be constant as each other. Right? So reactants are favored even though we're at equilibrium, even though we've hit this balance where forward rate equals reverse rate, uh, we have a situation where uh, we actually have more reactants than products. And if KEQ is equal to 1, this is just a sort of a nice sort of crossover value for us here. If KEQ is about 1, it's sort of like saying the product and the reactant concentration are about the same. We're going to need to qualify that same a little bit as we look more at specific examples, but it's sort of roughly saying it doesn't favor one or the other. Right? We have about the same reactants and products. Right? So now that we've sort of taken a look at uh, KEQ, let's just look specifically at a reaction here. Let's take a reaction as written. Now it's going to be important for you how they actually write the expression. So 2HI as a gas is becoming H2 as a gas and I2 as a gas. Based on the way I've written this, I would read the left-hand side to be reactants, the right-hand side to be products, as we have been doing for a long time. What they're going to ask you for is, for this equation, can you state, or can you give me, the KEQ expression? Can you give me the equilibrium constant expression? And all you would need to do is you need to say, oh, easy. KEQ is defined as the concentration of what's on the right-hand side products divided by the concentration of the reactants. I'm going to show you a couple little notes here. So the products this time are going to be H2 and I2. I have two of them. You're going to take the concentration of each one separately. So concentration H2, concentration I2. And because we're just defining this as a ratio, we want to know sort of total number of products here. We're just going to end up multiplying them. Sometimes for multiple choice questions, they try to trick you and they try to say plus. In general, this one shouldn't be a plus. So H2 times I2, those happens to be your products. We're going to then divide it by our reactants. Our reactants, you could have thought about this as it's HI plus HI, right? That's what 2HI means. So although we could have written this here, HI times HI, right? It's multiply. I just want to know as a gist sort of um, how many reactants I have. Well, it is HI times itself. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to say, okay, then KEQ is the H2 times the I2 all over HI squared. So here's one thing that we see. First thing we need to make sure is we have a balanced equation. If I actually have a number there, it actually ends up as a power in the KEQ expression. So the balanced coefficients, coefficients actually become powers in the KEQ expression. Right? And that's actually why I can't easily just say, oh, when KEQ is 1, that means they're identical, they're always equal. It's because sometimes we end up with these powers. So for example, if the H2 was uh, 5 molar and I2 was uh, 5 molar, the HI here could be 5 molar. It might end up working out as 1. In this case here, 5 squared does actually cancel out the 5 times 5. But in other cases, when I have, let's say, cubes involved here, the numbers may not necessarily exactly equal to 1. Right? KEQ is just going to be a number. This number here will be, sp uh, this is a constant for a specific temperature. So later on, we're going to be stressing it out. Oh, let's stress the concentration, and let's change the pressure, change the volume. As long as your temperature doesn't change, this number doesn't change. 
And again, we already talked about the size of this value. If this value here is big, it just means roughly speaking, we have more H2I2. If this number is small, we have roughly more H, uh, HI. But it's a constant for that specific temperature. What if, I told you it, it's important how they actually wrote it. What if they actually wrote this reaction in reverse, right? We are in equilibrium afterwards. After all, it can be left to right, right to left. What if instead I had put H2 as a gas reacts with I2 as a gas? It's effectively the same equation, right? 2HI as a gas, right? But again, conventionally here, we would then end up saying here, well, the left-hand side are reactants. This time I put the H2 and I2 as reactants. They were products in the first step. The HI is going to be products. What does the KEQ expression look like for this? KEQ still has to be products for reactants. This time our products are going to be HI. The number becomes the power, so HI squared, divided by H2 and I2. I thought K is supposed to be constant for the temperature. It's just based on the way I've written it. We now have sort of the reciprocal. So for example here, let's say this KEQ was 5, right? I happen to have way more H2 and I2. By writing it out, by flipping the equation, I end up having something like 1 over 5, and that's just the reciprocal of what it was before. So just as a conclusion here, um, when equations are reversed, when you put them back in front, basically the KEQ becomes the reciprocal, and the reciprocal is 1 over KEQ. Right? Other than that, KEQ should only change with temperature. Uh, one other note here, as we start doing this expression here, it's also going to matter what the state of matter is. Right? Because we're interested in talking about concentration, there are some states, like solid and liquids here, they never change state. So what we're going to actually do here to simplify things, so sort of next point here in KEQ, KEQ, the KEQ expression, KEQ expression actually ignores, in some sense it actually absorbs the constant, it ignores two things. It ignores all solids, and it ignores what are referred to as pure liquids. How do I know something to be a pure liquid? A pure liquid is the only thing that's designated as an L in the entire equilibrium. Left side, right side, if it's the only L, you can ignore it. The reason for this here is if we start thinking about, well, I want to go concentration of a solid. Uh, let's take a block uh, for now. So far, concentration makes sense when I'm talking about, let's say, aqueous, when I'm talking about gas, because concentration, let's say for aqueous, it's talking about how many swimmers, how many moles do I have, but they are actually swimming in a pool that's much larger than them. As a solid, we know the particles are all really tightly packed together. I could try to do a concentration solid. I can try to be like, well, how many moles worth of chemical are making up the solid? But this solid here, unlike the aqueous solution, they're not swimming in a large beaker. They're just swimming in a size made up by their structure. So sure, we can actually do a concentration of solid. So concentration of solid is basically the moles of solid divided by uh, the volume, the amount of space of the solid, right? It's not actually swimming inside a swimming pool or something like that. It's just going to be sort of the amount of material squeezed into this. That should look very familiar. That's sort of, it's similar to the density. We're not talking take the solid, dissolve it in a bunch of liquid, and making uh, different uh, strength orange juice, nothing like that. The concentration of solid is just purely the amount of material squeezed into this volume. Let me just put some rough numbers to this here. Uh, so far, I have four particles squeezed into one box of space. It's like my density is four, for argument's sake. What if I have more solid? What if I decide to have three of these solid? Well, because their density is the same, Sure, having three boxes here, I now have way more particles, right? I now have 12 particles. But if I also divide out how much room they're taking up, they're divided into three boxes worth of room. Notice that my density here stays the same. It's like the solid's concentration never changes, right? So in that case there, we can actually ignore it. What we're actually doing, I'll show you an example of this. Let's say we have A as a solid, 2B as a gas in equilibrium with 3C as a liquid, right? When we're tempted to write our KEQ expression here, KEQ is supposed to be concentration of products versus concentration of reactants. 
what I'm technically saying is I'm technically saying, yeah, sure, we have concentration of C, that's a liquid, the 3 goes up into the power, A is a solid, yep, I'm going to have that number, B with the square, that one goes up here, and I'm going to say, wait a second, this A here is a solid. Solid concentration doesn't change. You can have more solid, right? In this case here, I have three boxes versus one solid. I can have more solid, but by the time you actually do this ratio, this division, the concentration itself is still four. The concentration, more like density, doesn't change. It's intensive. So that's something you need to just sort of wrap your head around here. You can have more or less solid. That's fine. I can have five boxes, ten boxes, whatever. But at least when we talk about this phrasing here, specifically the concentration of a solid, this concentration like density actually doesn't change. Because it doesn't change, this number is not expected to change at all. The equilibrium might shift left, shift right, I may end up producing more B and whatever, but this number never changes. What I'm going to actually do is I'm going to sort of absorb this number into KEQ. Pretend like uh, I would have had a KEQ if that A number were there to scale down the number, but let's just absorb it. In a very similar fashion here, if it's a pure liquid, if it is the only L in the entire equation, this is a pure liquid. In the exact same fashion here, a pure liquid, I can have less liquid. I can figure out sort of what's the volume that my liquid uh, takes up. I can have more liquid, well, more particles, but it's also going to take up more volume. By the time you do that ratio, it also cancels out. I'm going to absorb that into KEQ as well. So instead of really showing you KEQ times A divided by C cubed or whatever, I'm just going to have always this assumption here. We're going to ignore solids, ignore pure liquids. So therefore, our new KEQ is just going to be, well, that's a liquid. I'm not going to include it. I'm just going to have a 1 on top. A is a solid. I'm going to ignore it. I only actually have B. Well, gases will change concentration. It'll change sort of how much room the particles are filling in. Then my um, equilibrium uh, constant is written as 1 over B squared. I still need the 1 over because the uh, B is a reactant, and we are always defining our uh, ratio as products of reactants. When is the liquid not pure? So what if it was like uh, D as a liquid, it's going to react with uh, 3E as a gas, and let's do equilibrium with uh, 4F as a liquid. Now to be sure, the liquids themselves, they should be pure. But again, in this case here, because there's more than one L, what we're going to do for the KEQ expression is you're going to actually need to include both of them. What can happen here, you may remember from your junior science classes, if I mix liquid D and I mix it with liquid F, even though I would expect the total volume to have increased, right? let's say I mix 10 mils and 20 mils, I'd expect the 30 mils here to be total, sometimes as a liquid, these particles here actually leave gaps between the D particles, these particles leave holes, empty spaces between the Fs, sometimes these particles end up filling in the gaps between the D, so that while your total volume is roughly going to be D plus F, because the volumes liquids can actually mix into each other, I need to include both of them. So we're going to have F as a product, the numbers become the powers, F to the power 4, and then we're going to have D, also liquid, and E to the power 3. Basically, it's always a product over a reactant, but so far what I've said here is we can ignore uh, solids and uh, pure liquids. Right. Uh, let me do one last little comparison here. Uh, your practice questions here will be just asking you, for this equilibrium, can you write the constant? For this equilibrium, can you write the constant here? The other thing that we're going to take note of is KEQ. I mentioned earlier it's specific to a certain temperature. KEQ only changes with temperature. So that means you can stress out concentration all you want. You can stress out pressure, add a catalyst all you want. This number doesn't change as long as we assume the temperature is constant. As long as the temperature changes, then all bets are off, then, temper then uh, the chemicals can change. So let me just do as a comparison sake here. Let's take a look at an expression. You're going to find uh, in this chapter a lot of the things we work with are gases, so they are actually included in the KEQ expression. As you step over to chapter 3, we're going to start getting solids and things that are liquids in chapter 4. So those ones, just remember you're going to uh, drop them. We're going to ignore them. So 2NOCl as a gas. And this one here happens to be uh, 76 kilo kilojoules here. It's exothermic as written. First question they're going to ask you, state the KEQ expression. State the, I'll give you the full name. State the equilibrium constant. That was KEQ. But state the expression for it. State the products over reactants for this particular equation. 
even if later on uh, tomorrow we're going to put all numbers to this here, I would still write out um, the expression with the chemical sub in. So KEQ here, concentration of products is equal. My products here is going to be NOCL, the number goes up into the power, NOCL squared, divided by, uh, my NO is also gas here, NO squared, times it by CL2. That is my equilibrium constant expression. Right? So that's all we're going to need to do. I want you to think in terms of uh, stresses again. So let's talk about two stresses. First thing that I do, let's stress out temperature. Let's say my stress is I decide to increase temperature. I decided to heat up this entire box. Right? It was happy the way it was, but suddenly I end up heating it up. Let's do the answer first. How does the equilibrium respond? Which way does it shift to if I increase temperature? Again, although I'm heating up the entire box, the easiest is going to be, think about the heat term here as a chemical. Imagine increasing that chemical. Which side do I need to shift to to get rid of this chemical? You should be able to tell me here, the equilibrium needs to shift left. The 2NOCl needs to absorb some of that 76 and end up becoming the 2NO and the Cl2. So therefore, my equilibrium, what's the response? The equilibrium shifts left. Right, it's going to respond, it's going to try to get rid of some of that heat. What's the consequence then? The NO and the Cl2, which happen to be reactants, those are going to climb, and the NOCl, which is the only product, the NOCl is going to drop. Right? Let's plot this out here graphically because I want to show you something here. So we're going to plot concentration versus time. Right? I don't know the relative starting numbers. I don't know what temperature we're at. I don't know whether we have more products or more reactants. So I'm just going to roughly plot in here. Let's say my NOCl was a starting line up there. Let's say my NO was a little bit lower than it. And let's say my Cl2 is a little bit lower than that one. Notice that in this condition here, these concentrations are constant in time. right? So because concentrations are constant in time, we know this indicates to us that we are currently in equilibrium. Then we can do Le Chatelier. Then we can start poking at it by increasing temperature. As I increase temperature, it's a gradual change. It's not like suddenly one of these is going to jump up or jump down. But as I suddenly increase temperature, gradually you're going to generate more NO and CO2. The NO is going to climb by a ratio of 2. So this one here is going to climb up a little bit faster. Uh, the CO2 is going to climb up by a factor of 1. Right? So that's going to increase. The concentration it goes higher. And the NOCO is the only product. The NOCO actually drops. So this one here drops totally possible that these ones here can actually cross, doesn't really matter. They can equal each other as well. Just for simplicity, I'm going to just keep them apart from each other. Okay, But they're just concentrations here. I just really care about the change. Eventually, these lines here end up equal again. They end up like sort of flattening out. That's what I mean by equal. And therefore, this one here is actually going to have hit equilibrium again. But you notice this is a very special type of change. I have actually changed temperature. By changing temperature, I have changed what the KEQ could be because KEQ only changes with temperature. So imagine with me here taking the NOCL, taking this number, squaring it, dividing by this number, NO squared, and this number. The KEQ would give you that ratio. Now you notice all three numbers are different. The NOCL is different from earlier. It's a little bit lower. This one here is now a little bit higher. Sorry, I should point. Uh, the NO is now a little bit higher and the Cl2 is a little bit higher. So although the expression remains the same, it's still NOCl squared and all that's the same, but the actual numbers I'm going to sub in are actually going to be different. We're actually going to have a different valued KEQ. The KEQ here, right, KEQ, um, KEQ1 before is going to be a different number than KEQ2, and KEQ2 will be the same fraction, the same operation, but when you start using these three numbers after the shifting has occurred. Right? So that really shouldn't surprise you all that much because, well, I have three totally different numbers. Why should this uh, factor remain constant? What's interesting, however, let's do one more shift, then we'll end off with this. Let's just rewrite this here. 2NOCl2 is in equilibrium with 2NOCl. Let's say this time my shift is, or sorry, my stress. I'm poking at the system. Uh, let's say my stress is I actually increase um, increase NOCL. So I add NOCL. Okay. Again, let's do the answer first. So we have the box. 
And what I decided to do is I decided to pump in a lot of NO2. The system doesn't like the fact that suddenly you have a lot of NOCl, more of these guys here can collide together, the reverse rate is going to increase, it's going to end up shifting left. So same as earlier, right? Equilibrium shifts left. Right? Again, let's ask the easier questions first. What happens to the NO? Well, the NO goes up. What happens to the Cl2? The Cl2 goes up. Those are having to be reactants. The NOCl, a little bit more challenging. If I plotted that out on a graph, if I plotted the NOCl line versus time, I'm actually increasing the NOCl. I've suddenly increased it. Over time, this is going to gradually drop. I want it to decrease during the shift, but remember, it never really gets back down to what it was earlier. So that's what's happening to the NOCl line this time compared to earlier. NOCl will just gradually decrease like that. I can have the very same. The NO line here is going to climb. It's going to go up by a certain amount. Uh, maybe the Cl2. Okay, the Cl2 here is also going to climb up, right? What I want to show you here is, from what it looks like, there shouldn't be the KEQ should be different, right? Because I start off with sort of these three numbers here from a KEQ expression. My KEQ, I thought it's just called K. NOCl squared divided by NO squared divided by Cl2 squared like this. I'm using three totally different numbers, and now after we reach equilibrium again, now all three numbers are different again. Just a general comparison, however, here. We'll notice that earlier, the products had just dropped. That one went down, the other two went up. So products dropping mean NOCl went down, the products increasing. I would expect the KEQ would actually decrease because the products are getting bigger. This time it's a slightly different story. The NO and the CO2 have increased. The products here have increased. But because Le Chatelier never really gets it back down to what it should have been, my NOCL has also increased. And what I want to show you here is because our stress was not a temperature change, somehow even though all three numbers are different from the earlier numbers here, somehow they preserve this ratio here. Somehow the KEQ at the end of the day is the same as the KEQ here. There was definitely a shift. There was definitely a response from the equilibrium. But by defining the KEQ in this fashion here, because it's only temperature dependent here, the KEQ, the KEQ is the same as before. So KEQ is a number. The bigger the number, products are favored. The smaller the number, reactions are favored. Even though during the shift, all the numbers have changed. But they've changed in such a way that the KEQ is the same as they were here, even though all three numbers are different. So let's just write that down here. Although shifting has changed concentrations, they've changed in such a way that preserve this KEQ ratio. Uh, but the ratio KEQ, this products over reactants, uh, is the same constant. Right. Um, so what's left over in our chapter is we're actually going to put some numbers to this uh, over the next two classes or so, and then we're going to see how this works out. Right. If you have any problems, just let me know. Thanks, guys.